Steve Levin, and I'm the project scientist for Juno. We're sending a spacecraft to try to understand the interior and the origin of Jupiter. The mission launched August 5th, 2011 from the Earth. It went in orbit around the Sun, out past the orbit of Mars. Then we fired the main engine on the spacecraft to aim, actually a couple of times, to bring it all the way back to Earth. And then as the Earth moved along, it came in behind the Earth and got a gravity assist. And that set it on a course all the way out to Jupiter. So then the plan for the rest of the mission is to come past Jupiter very, very close to the planet and way out here far away for 14 days. Come around and do it again every two weeks for about a year and a half. And each time we do one of those passes past the planet, a flyby really, we'll turn on all our science instruments and measure a whole bunch of things about Jupiter. There's a myth from Roman mythology where Jupiter, the king of the gods, was down on the earth fooling around, getting into trouble. And he didn't want his wife to catch him, so he covered the earth with clouds so that Juno, his wife, wouldn't be able to see what he was doing. But Juno was a goddess too, so she parted the clouds and she saw the true nature of Jupiter. Well, obviously what we're trying to do with our spacecraft is peer beneath the clouds and understand the true nature of Jupiter. So the story seemed really apt and we named our spacecraft Juno. The biggest thing we're trying to learn with Juno is how do solar systems form? Jupiter by far is the largest planet. It's so big that in, in a very real sense, it's two thirds of the planets all by itself. 300 times the mass of the Earth so big you could fit over a thousand Earths inside it. And it formed first. So whatever we learn from Jupiter is going to teach us about the early history of the solar system in a way we can't really learn from, from the other planets in the solar system. We want to know how much water is there in Jupiter. And that's because the information from that single number, how much water does Jupiter have, tells us a lot about how did the planet form. If Jupiter formed from the same cloud of gas and dust that made the Sun, then it should have the same composition. If Jupiter formed, as the leading theory suggests, from large chunks of ice, say asteroid-sized objects made out of ice that collided and stuck together, then there's gonna be a lot more water, a lot more oxygen compared to what you see in the sun. We see an enormous magnetic field on Jupiter. We know that that comes from an ocean of liquid metallic hydrogen. That swirling ocean of liquid metallic hydrogen at pressures upwards of two million times the pressure here on the Earth, makes Jupiter's enormous magnetic field. We see belts and zones on the surface, jet streams in Jupiter's enormous atmosphere, clouds moving at the top of the atmosphere at hundreds of miles an hour in opposite directions. But that's all the very surface of the atmosphere, the clouds at the top. We want to know what's underneath that. We want to know how deep do those things go. We think way down in the center beneath all of that atmosphere is a dense core maybe 3 to 20 times the mass of the Earth. What are we going to do to get that? How are we going to learn about the interior and the origin of Jupiter? To understand that interior, we can't drop a probe into Jupiter. The pressure is just way too high to do anything useful. We can use radio waves to see beneath the clouds deeper into the atmosphere. Our last critical event in the mission is JOI, Jupiter Orbit Insertion. That's happening on the 4th of July this year. It's a critical event because it has to work, and it has to work at the right time. We've got to span somewhere in the neighborhood of an hour for, in which we have to fire that main engine for half an hour or so to put ourselves in the right orbit to be captured by Jupiter and orbit the planet instead of blowing on past it. We have all kinds of safeguards built in where if something goes wrong, the spacecraft will restart the main engine burn without any influence from Earth. We're confident this is going to work, but at the same time, it's a critical event. It has to happen at the right time. You don't get any second chances. When Juno started depends a little bit on who you ask and which part they think is important and what they remember. But for me, it started somewhere around the year 2000 with what amounted to a hallway conversation with Scott Bolton, who's our principal investigator. And we were chatting about, wouldn't it be great to have a radio receiver or microwave instrument on a spacecraft at Jupiter we worked on that for a couple of years. We started writing the proposal for that. We had a big competition and ultimately they chose Juno. So in about 2006, we were chosen, we're gonna do this. Started building hardware, I wanna say about 2009. Once it's all assembled, you gotta test it all as one big thing. And then finally it goes down to Cape Canaveral and, and you get it all set, put it on a rocket and cross your fingers and launch it and August 27th is when we will first get to take our science instruments and turn them on and look at Jupiter from close up for the first time.